Ronnie and Anita Smith were serving as gospel workers in Libya when Ronnie was martyred for his faith. Was it worth it? Here's how Anita answers that question. I do remember Ronnie saying before that if he could only have one person turn to Jesus with his life, that it would have been worth it. I wanted the people that did the shooting to know that Jesus teaches us to love our enemies and that's what causes people to come to know Jesus and to come to know what the gospel is. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Hi, I'm Todd Nettleton. Grateful to be back with you on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you for joining us this week. Do you ever struggle to forgive the people who wrong you? Our guest today is going to challenge all of us about the power of forgiveness to put the gospel of Jesus Christ on display. In her case, on display for the whole world to see. Anita Smith is going to tell the story of how she and her family were called to Libya and how that calling required a high price. I talked with Anita during the Hearts of Fire virtual event, which inspired thousands of people on July the 14th, and which you can still watch. We will give you a link to watch it online at our website, vomradio.net. Ronnie and Anita and their infant son moved to Benghazi, Libya, just a few months after the attack on the American consulate there. Four Americans were killed in that attack, and I asked Anita what it was like to move to a place that seemed so dangerous. The time really did seem like it was the perfect time, despite what was going on, the hardship that was going on in Libya, the civil war, the unrest. And we wanted to take God's love and the gospel to Libya, to Benghazi, because we knew that they just didn't know who Jesus is. How much fear was there? It's obviously, it's a dangerous place. These Americans have just been killed there. Mm -hmm. How did you wrestle through that? And how did God, again, kind of confirm, nope, this is where I want you to go? At the time, I did have natural fears and I was worried, but I, I know for sure that we did have God's peace with us. As we were settling in there, there were definitely ups and downs of feeling that fear The people that we met there, the Libyans, they were extremely welcoming and loving and very protective of us. So yes, there were times when they were telling us to stay indoors, we'll do your grocery shopping for you. I was scared and I did have the fear of kidnapping and of course death. Myself more than Ronnie. It wasn't something that was paralyzing though. We were still able to do our daily things that were the norm and still be able to visit our neighbors and enjoy our times with them. So it wasn't paralyzing. It was just something that was there that we would pray through. Mm -hmm. I love Ronnie's Twitter bio, which is Libya's best friend. Mm -hmm. How did you live that out? What what did that look like in your life there to to go and, and try to be Libya's best friend? So he was the high school chemistry teacher at the International School of Benghazi. So the students there are speaking English, so right? So he's Correct. teaching in English. Correct. But then obviously you're learning Arabic as well. Yes. So we're learning Arabic, just conversational Arabic from our neighbors who are getting to know us. And he would learn some Arabic from his students. But yes, yeah, since they spoke, they spoke English very well. And they really loved him as a teacher. He was extremely smart and gifted and well educated in that role. But apart from that, just his personality and how he was able to connect with the students, it was really a special thing. Like they, they were really devastated when they heard um, of the news that he had passed away. And they gave him that name. I think it was like a, both of them kind of forming that name mm-hmm. on his Twitter. And they just enjoyed joking with him. They enjoyed his humor. And he was able to have not just school conversations with them, but just life conversations. The neighbors that we had, fortunately, they were parents with five kids. 
some of the husbands did know English, so they, were, they made really good friendships with Ronnie. And the wives didn't know too much English, but they just loved that we tried to, that I tried to speak Arabic to them. Thursdays or Fridays, the women get together or the men get together for tea and a gathering, just laughing. Even though I didn't know all the conversations and all of the meanings, it was fun. You really felt their love. You felt being included. And they invited me to their weddings. And some of the younger generation that did speak English, they were able to translate. It really did work out that I was able to even talk about Jesus and talk about who he is to me. And that, yes, they also talk about Islam and Muhammad. And, and so it's in, in a respectful manner that we're able to engage in conversations. And then we can have conversations about our kids and just normal day-to-day -day conversations that normal people have. It wasn't some kind of extravagant lifestyle at all. And the multi-generation families there, mm -hmm. it seems like they just kind of just brought you in. You're like part of the family now. Yes. I mean, I remember a specific time where my immediate neighbor, her mother-in-law, so she's an elderly woman, and she wanted to walk me home in the dark. <laughs> and I was like, you don't have to do that. She's like, no, no, no one's going to harm an elderly woman. I'm the one that's going to walk with you and walk you back to your home. That's how much they really looked out for us and really cared for us. I mean, she was probably in her 80s, and she was like locking arms with me. And then she walked home alone in the dark because she knew no one would harm her. Obviously, you can't go to Libya and say, we're here to be missionaries. We're, we're going to plant a church. Right. But you're there to advance the gospel. Mm -hmm. You want to tell people about Jesus. How, how did you do that? Or how did you try to steer some of those conversations into spiritual things? It was easy to speak to the Libyans and just tell them we believe that God wanted us to move here. We wanted to show you what love that we know is from Jesus, his peace. We are a child of God. And so we are just going to live our life out. And we wanted to do that in a place that didn't know Jesus and didn't know his extravagant love, his gospel. Let's talk about the day in December of 2013. Mm -hmm. You and your son had come back early for Christmas. Ronnie was finishing out the semester and then he was going to come for Christmas too. Talk me through that day and how you found out about what had happened. So I received a call from the Libyan family that we're very close with. They FaceTimed or Skyped with me. It was very out of the ordinary to receive a call, a Skype call from them at my nine in the morning. And the grandmother, who doesn't speak any English, she was just crying because she loves us. And through tears, they were telling me, oh, we're so very sorry, Ronnie, Ronnie has died. And they were crying, and I was in complete shock. What did you hear had happened mm -hmm. in Libya with Ronnie? So he was jogging in our neighborhood. It was daylight. It was about 11 or 11.15 a.m. Benghazi time. And he was followed by a black Jeep. And supposedly there was a witness who heard some conversations that went on between the men in the Jeep, about four of them, with Ronnie. So he saw the Jeep suspiciously slow and going towards Ronnie, stopped, had a conversation, and they went around. And then he saw that Ronnie was jogging and turned a corner and that the Jeep came back. And then he heard immediately the gunshots. Obviously, you're in shock. Mm -hmm. You're in incredible grief. Mm -hmm. How did Jesus show up? How did God show up in that situation? Ronnie's family, out of state, and in state, just rushed to my house that day, our church in Texas. Same day, they all, a group of them came and loved on me and wanted to care for me, wanted to pray with me. So all of that was like very present. It's like the body of Christ, really being the body of Christ, mm -hmm. literally yes. putting Christ's arms around you. One of the things in your story that really amazes people and amazes me, quite frankly, is just a few days later, mm -hmm. you're on national television forgiving the people who killed Ronnie, mm -hmm. talking about how much you still love Libya, love the people of Libya. I was with, not very long ago, a 
person whose husband was martyred in the Middle East, and she talked about it taking five years to come to the point of being able to say, I forgive those mm -hmm. evil men who killed my husband. You got there in five days. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. Kind of talk me through how you came to that point of saying, I'm not going to hate those people. I forgive them. We wanted our lives really to glorify Jesus. We only have one life here. Yes, we make a lot of mistakes and we have the opportunity and the grace to ask for forgiveness, but we, we wanted our lives to be known that we love Jesus. And I do remember Ronnie saying before that if he could only have one person turn to Jesus with his life, that it would have been worth it. And I wanted the people that did the shooting to know that Jesus is different. Jesus is a God that loves people who make mistakes and who do crime and it's not okay what they did at all. That doesn't mean that they're freed from the consequences of it, but that Jesus teaches us to love our enemies and that's what causes people to come to know Jesus and to come to know what the gospel is. And I've never been in a situation where someone has sinned against me to that degree where it's been hard to forgive somebody. And I just really wanted them to know this is a horrific thing that you've done but look at the extravagant thing that Jesus has done. And you can't beat us down. You can't beat me down. Is it something that you kind of said, Lord, I'm going to need your help. I need to forgive these people. Or did God just kind of give that to you and it just kind of welled up within you? Honestly, I do believe that this was something that God gave me because I did want to show them that this is what Jesus, what he lives for. I mean, we're all his enemies. And... He wants us to know that He loves us. And there is no other message or faith that shows that you, you love your enemies and you forgive your enemies, except for Jesus. You can watch those videos on YouTube of those interviews that you did. And, and we're talking major national media figures. And they didn't know what to do with you mm -hmm. when you said, I still love the Libyan people. I forgive the... They're just like... They had no idea yes. how to respond to you. I, I mean, I was very open about it. I was very open telling them that, because I do love the Libyan people that I knew. It wasn't a hatred towards them at all. They, they hated this. They were angry about it. They were crying about it. They didn't want any of this to happen. They didn't want it to happen on Libyan soil. And so whenever the newscaster was saying, well, how can you still love them? I was in their living rooms and I, that's not what they wanted for anybody and not for us. And as far as the attackers, it's not an excuse to say that they're lost and that's why they did it because that's completely wrong for them to have done this. But that, that's the gospel message is to love people and, and to show them the grace that I know is from Jesus. All of the hurt and anger that I have over the years, my struggle has been with God. I mean, he showers me with love and grace, but it's not towards the attackers. How do those wrestling matches go? Is it you coming to God and saying, how, how could you let this happen? My, my husband was killed. Mm -hmm. My son doesn't have a father now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just as the days pass and the months pass, and my son was two at the time, he's now 11. He doesn't remember a lot of that. And now it's like a different stage of grief because now he's 10, 11. So he has a memory of just videos or pictures, but not like a real representation, unfortunately. So my son, he plays uh, hockey and tennis, for example, and he knows his father really loved those sports, so he wishes that he could enjoy those things with him. He does ask, what would my dad have enjoyed? Or did he ever enjoy this sport or do this sort of things? It, in some ways, he doesn't know what to ask either. So Just kind of wants to know what his dad was like. What, yes. Oh. It's like this short time that we were there that completely turned our world upside down for the rest of our lives. I just ask God, and then he does comfort me. And whenever I read the Bible, you know, our sufferings here are for a short time. 
compared to the eternal weight that we will receive of glory of being with Jesus. And I knew all this going in. Ronnie and I, we talked a lot about suffering. We, we spoke with other people that had gone through some suffering and just what G the whole gospel is, you pick up your cross and if you are a disciple, it's not a matter of if you will suffer, it's when. How does God respond in those times to remind you of his grace and to remind you, I'm the husband of the widow? Um, it's definitely through friends and family. They have showered me with love, have always pointed me towards God, his comfort, and it's just them coming alongside me, being able to walk through the pain with me, understanding that, you know, I'm not in your shoes, but this isn't easy, and we're not going to say that it's okay. And Jesus knows that. A really powerful message that I remember was when Jesus was on the cross, he had seven sayings, and one was to John saying to take care of his mom, who is a widow. And there's just so much love that Jesus has to say, the Bible has to say about widows and orphans. It's evident, and he's such a personal God that understands the pain that I went through and am going through. We heard a story just in the last couple of weeks, actually, uh, of a Libyan brother who was inspired to accept Christ, reading your testimony on Facebook after Ronnie was killed. What does that do for you that God used that to see a Libyan one to the kingdom? It's, it's really powerful for me to hear those stories because, because I do feel at times you know, we lived in Libya for that short period of time. What dent have we made to show who Jesus is? I mean, yes, I was able to speak on the news, but it's almost like it's the next news story. So that's forgotten and then years pass. So it's, it's very special to me to hear when a Libyan has come in contact with what I said and pointing them to Jesus. And I know for sure, at, when Jesus comes back, he says, people of all tongues, of all nations will be at the throne and they will be there from Libya. Amen. They will. And I was, someone had encouraged me, telling me, Anita, there has not been big opportunities for people to be able to tell the Libyan people about Jesus. You were on the news, you were speaking in their language, in their native tongue, telling them that you forgive them because Jesus says to forgive your enemies, and people are gonna know that. And I don't want the glory for myself, I really don't. And so he was just trying to encourage me that, you know, even when I'm not here, there's gonna be that story. Maybe I won't have the name, that's okay that it's not Anita, but that this is what was told in the Libyan language. And we should say, we, we mentioned the media interviews here in the States in English, but you also did that in Arabic on Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. broadcast all over the Middle East. I think about Ronnie saying, if, if one, if we could reach one Libyan, mm -hmm. you reached millions, thousands at least, tens of thousands. It's interesting how God has taken your sacrifice and Ronnie's sacrifice mm -hmm. and totally used it in the kingdom. Yeah, and it's a way that I would have never probably even had guessed one of the things that God used in yours and Ronnie's life was a sermon by John Piper about giving all for missions. After Ronnie was killed, John Piper wrote a, an article about how that weighed on him, like something he had said had mm -hmm. led this young family to go and this man had laid down his life. Richard Wormbrand famously said, if you don't want any more martyrs, please don't give us any more money because we're going to send more Bibles and there's going to be more people come to Christ and some of those people are going to be killed. So if, if that makes you uncomfortable, you know, please don't give. We're asking people, we're telling people, do give, mm -hmm. do send more Bibles, do send more people to share the gospel. And we understand there's, there's going to be more Anitas, there's going to be more Ronnies. Talk to us about, I mean, why we should still, even knowing that, that people are going to suffer because of, because of God, because mm -hmm. of his word. Being a Christian, it is a joy. And at the same time, that joy is with 
with pain. I mean, the Bible gives us different examples of a woman going through labor. It is painful, but she gets the joy of her infant in her arms. And so walking with Christ is a joy. You get to see people who didn't know Jesus and then they turn to Jesus or you get to pray alongside people that are in pain or who are suffering. And Paul tells us in Philippians that the gospel is a gift and so is suffering for his sake. And That's a gift none of us want. <laughs> right, it's not. And I remember having a conversation with Ronnie saying that we need to pray that we will endure suffering and it's not an optional thing. And it could be different for anybody. It doesn't mean everybody is going to die a martyr's death. It's so important to still provide the resources to send people to areas that people don't know Jesus, to get those Bibles out there. Yes, there will be deaths involved. There are so many right now as we're speaking that I don't know who's imprisoned, but we have to come alongside those people and those small groups of new churches to encourage them and to pray for them and to hear their stories so that we could know who they are. And when there are deaths, when there are sacrifices, we need to be ready to be the body of Christ and, and come alongside those who are left behind. Yes, it's a gift to be able to come alongside someone just as I knew that they showered me with love and with prayers and with resources and gifts. My son and I, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did in terms of just surviving the day to day without their support. One of the things that we're doing this evening is we're challenging people to pray for widows, especially widows of Christian martyrs. Are there some specific things that you would remind, maybe things that most of us wouldn't think of that we can encourage people to pray for the widows of Christian martyrs around the world? To r remind them that their life and their sacrifice is for Jesus. And another thing would be to be mindful that even if it happened two months ago, two years ago, or 10 years ago, the hurt is still there. Every day they miss that person, they miss their husband, to remember that you know, their, their pain is still there and their sorrow is just on a different way of being able to manage it. Anita, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for, for being very real and very raw. And uh, we honor you, we honor Ronnie, and we honor your sacrifice. So thank you, thank you much. so much. Thank you very much. I mean, during my early stages of becoming a Christian, so in my early to mid 20s, I don't know how it happened, but I was receiving the Voice of the Martyr subscription, and I was just shocked that there were places where people were being persecuted. I didn't understand persecution and suffering for the gospel. And I read Richard's early book, and I was amazed by it, and it's always stuck with me. And then I would have never guessed 20 years later that I would be a part of anything with Voice of the Martyrs. So um, that I'm able to give my testimony to encourage others. If you ask me in my early 20s, would I ever want to? I don't know, that's scary. <laughs> but this is how it's come about. And I hope that God can use my life and Ronnie's life and now our son's life to continue to point people to Jesus. Anita Smith has been reminding us how much each of us has been forgiven by Jesus and she's told us a riveting story about the ability that all of us have to forgive others, not in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anita and I talked during the Hearts of Fire virtual event. If you missed any of our conversation, you can hear this episode again by visiting vomradio.net. When you come to the website, we're also going to give you a link to watch the entire Hearts of Fire virtual event. I would encourage you, don't watch it by yourself. Gather your family, maybe your Bible study group, maybe your whole church, and be inspired together by the testimonies of Anita and three other women who suffered for the name of Christ. We also have worship in the event by Michael W. Smith. We'll give you a link to watch that whole event at our website, vomradio.net. Again, vomradio.net. Next week, we're going to meet someone who's been sharing the gospel in the Middle East for years. He's seen a lot of changes and a lot of openness to Jesus. 
I know you'll be inspired by that conversation, so be back with us next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.